Hey, so it's, uh, it's the new year. 2020 is mercifully ending. And uh, I thought as a bit of a fun way to close out the year, I'm going to put out uh, a couple of episodes that are not really regular episodes. Back in the fall, we put on the Manitoba Podcast Festival virtually, uh, obviously because of the uh, pandemic. And there were some really great panels um, on a whole pile of podcast related topics. And I moderated a couple of them. So the next two episodes are going to be panels that I moderated at the festival. Get up off your ass and get up on the podcast! Which police radio? Which police radio? Which police radio? Which police radio? Get up off your ass and get up on the podcast! Which police radio? Welcome to the Manitoba Podcast Festival. This is the second panel. I hope that a lot of you caught the first panel this morning, which was the Podcasting 101, just kind of the raw basics uh, for you know starting a podcast and, and getting going on that. And this one's a little bit more, um, I don't want to say in-depth, because that one was fairly in-depth as well, but we're talking to people who you know have podcasts that are already in effect. They've already been working on them. They've already been uh, developed their, their, their format, their subject matter. And now this is to sort of discuss just growing an audience and, and keeping that audience. Because I think that, uh, as may have come up in the first panel, one of the biggest problems people have with podcasting is that they start it and it's going well, but then they don't see the numbers that they want to get and they bail. I, I know a lot of people personally who have started podcasts and have just completely quit after three episodes because mm. they didn't see what they expected, which was, I think, celebrity level numbers, which is unrealistic, but you know, that's kind of how it happens. But um, I think just to get everything started here, uh, since all of our panelists are here right now, uh, I'm Sam. I am one of the co-organizers of the podcast festival for the past three years. I host a show called Witch Police Radio, which is a uh, music interview show talking to local Manitoba musicians and musicians see- music scene uh, related folks. And uh, yeah, so we have guests um, for the first time on this festival from the U.S. So maybe we'll start with you guys um, who host uh, the Propagandy podcast. And the reason... I wanted you on is a because I listen to your show and I really like it, and b because you're from out of town, out of out of country, and you're focusing on uh, a very local Manitoba topic. So, if the two of you want to just introduce yourselves and uh, maybe let the audience know who you are, we can go from there. Yeah, my name is Keith Goff. I am an eighth grade U.S. history teacher, and okay. I'm a co-host of Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda. And uh, Greg and I have done just about 20 episodes so far, and it's been, uh, you know, a lot of fun. And it's also really cool to be a part of this. And I'm Greg Soden. I'm a uh, teacher. I live in Buffalo, New York, right on the border with Canada. The border is currently closed, so I miss yes. going across a whole lot. Um, but I am the co-host of Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda, And I also have another podcast called the Classical Ideas Podcast, which is an academic podcast about the study of religion and philosophy uh, in the world. And our Unscripted Moments podcast has 20 episodes co- almost, and my Classical Ideas podcast has 177 episodes. So I've been doing this for a bit. For sure. And then Ryan McMahon is our other panelist here. And uh, I think the reason I wanted kind of you as well as these guys on the show is because you've been doing this for a long time. You've had uh, a number of shows that have you know pulled in big audiences, and you continue to churn out content uh, you know at a pretty remarkable pace. And you've certainly grown over the years that I've been listening to your stuff in terms of just, you know, size and, and public awareness of what you do. So uh, do you want to just introduce yourself and give a bit of background about your podcasting history? Sure. Uh, it's nice to be here with everybody. Oh, thanks um, for coming. Well, no, thanks for having me. And uh, congrats on the festival under, uh, you know, pretty extreme circumstances. So kudos to you guys and the volunteers and people that got behind this to, uh, to bring us together today. Uh, it's always Always a good day when nerds can unite and talk about <laughs> podcasting. So sure, yeah, yeah. Um, and everyone watching, I love you, beautiful nerds too. So um, <clears throat> I started podcasting in 2008. I was a stay-at-home dad. Um, I bought a MacBook to go to law school, and um, uh, very quickly learned I didn't want to go to law school. <laughs> so I had a MacBook <laughs> with GarageBand on it. And back then, um, inside of GarageBand, there was a little purple the little purple uh, icon podcasting icon and uh, I pressed it and back then it will open up a a pop-up inside of GarageBand that was basically like um, a wave file and I hit record and I didn't know what I was doing having never used any sort of digital audio software before 
Um, and I saw the wave file flat and I thought, well, I don't have a piano to plug into this thing. Like I can't make music. So I was about to close it until, uh, I saw the wave file bounce and I thought, Oh, there's a microphone on the laptop. Right. And, um, and I was a stay at home dad and, and a stand up comic that had just left Toronto. I was in a new city, didn't have friends, didn't have a, a community. And I turned to podcasting basically as a chance to continue to stay sharp in comedy writing and, and, um, and sort of the rest is history. I've never left the podcasting space. I've, I've uh, doubled down into it uh, a number of times through both my own efforts in podcasting, but building a podcast network for indigenous yeah. people. Uh, it's called Indian and Cowboy. And, um, and yeah, I, I, I support uh, new podcasters. I mentor a lot of different podcasters in, in a lot of different ways. And then of course my own work has, has now found audiences and I'm, 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 very passionate about this space. I protect this space from the dirt bags that, that try to come in and make money from the space yeah. by, by pulling bullshit over people that don't know better, including advertisers and mm. funders and investors. And um, we'll get into all of that a little bit later about, we will, yeah. Uh, yeah. about audience, but, um, but uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm really passionate about the space and, and uh, I'm really grateful to be here today. So thanks. Cool. Well, uh, th that's awesome. I'm glad glad all of you are here. And kind of the reason I was hoping that this would this would work out with these these two sets of podcasters here is because, um, like I was saying before we started here with you guys, there's a a bit of a different route towards getting uh, larger numbers of listeners because the Propaganda Show is only how many months old at this point? Jeez, Six. I think it was April. like June. So yeah, it's real. It's really new, right? Mm -hmm. So, but you're yet yeah, you're pulling in numbers, you know, based on your tweet the other day that I, I think a lot of beginning podcasters would be very jealous of and you're kind of now thrust into this thing where you have not only a large listener base but high profile guests i mean some of your guests you're getting are insane and and then ryan on the other hand has you've kind of done the more of the slow route i think where you've you've built and built and built and branched out in all these different directions and i think your audience has, has come with you and then grown substantially sort of since then so it's it's different ways of going about it and i think that that whole concept of, of getting listeners and keeping them and, and finding out how to engage with them is one of the biggest struggles that podcasters have because you're talking into the void basically. Right. Mm. And unless you have some kind of advanced analytics or whatever, or you're getting good feedback from listeners, you don't necessarily know really who it's reaching or how they're responding or what. So I think um, just to start with, uh, with the propaganda show, um, how did this like this grew really really fast for you guys and obviously the the subject matter helps because you're talking about a band that has a you know a strong audience uh, regardless but how quickly did you get like how quickly did the numbers start rolling in for you when you realized this was more than just a fun hobby that your friends would listen to so the first month that we were live we only got like 400 downloads um in the whole month but the the only reason that anybody even knows about the show is because um first of all chris hanna very graciously shared what we were doing on his patreon page mm. then he also put it out on twitter to his 30,000 followers who follow the propaganda official twitter and then todd kowalski was very gracious about sharing out some of the episodes on the official propaganda instagram page and then we also had su lin as a guest very early on in the show. And then Sue Lin shared uh, the episode of Tertium Non Dator that, um, that they were a guest on. So it, it's, it's complete luck. Um, it, I feel extremely fortunate that the band didn't completely freak out because it's, you know, it's a, a very serious uh, set of songs and it's a long legacy of amazing work that this band has put together. And we're just a couple of fans. And the, the goal of the show was to just to put together a show that, fans of propaganda talking about propaganda songs and then getting a lot of stories down on the record for why people like it so all i did is i, I just go on twitter and instagram every other day and i search propaganda in those in the search bar and i go and i like a bunch of cool tweets and a bunch of cool instagram messages and i just try to be really engaging with listeners but we're very lucky that the band um was cool with it like right from the very beginning so that's that honestly it's 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 just good luck as well yeah and i think that helped connect us with like some initial listeners you know starting conversations people saying oh i didn't even realize there was a a podcast about this band and a lot of those people we continue to just you know chat with you know all things related to music sure just using social media um but i i think that 
that endorsement and that the, the, the sharing from the band itself, especially as Chris has his own podcast on Patreon. Yes. You know, we were very wary of, you know, seeming like we, we, we wanted to cut into that space or, or step on his toes. Uh, so we've, we've been sure to encourage, you know, our listeners to also support his show, which is <laughs> way better than ours. <laughs> <laughs> well, something you said uh, a little bit earlier about kind of the, um, the seriousness of the material you're talking about, right? And then the, the, the kind of the depth of material, it's talking about social issues, it's talking about political issues. Once you have that audience, because he, you know, maybe Chris tweeted it out or, or, or whatever, how do you retain it? I mean, how do you guys make it so what you're saying about these songs, what your guests are saying about these songs is worthwhile to that audience? Because I think that might be one of the bigger challenges is, you know, I could do a show where I say, hey, my favorite band is whatever, and, and just start blabbing about the songs, but it has to be good, right? And it has to be something that is going to catch people's ear week after week after week. Yeah, it's a tremendous amount of work. It's a tremendous amount of research. We dig into the songs and the lyrics and the nuance of the events found within the songs as much as we possibly can. We try to get some local context if the songs take place in certain places. So Sam, you've like you, you and I have written a lot about like the, some of the songs in Winnipeg and, you know, call before you dig. And you sent yeah. me all kinds of like interesting tips about like Winnipeg and Walsley and things like that. It's Cause I can't so, stop talking about Winnipeg. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's all about like going to where the story is essentially sure. and investigating as much as possible. And we miss things and we mess stuff up and we are, we're never going to get it all perfectly right, but we put a tremendous amount of work into it. Uh, each week and it's just something that we are just obsessed with so we just kind of are doing these things all along the week um and then we just like make a bunch of notes and then we just kind of bring what we found and just talk about what we found together um the guests that we've been reaching out to have been really really cool and very gracious and you know that definitely helps um but it's 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 very hard work um and you know, we, we, we do have people that give us feedback and whenever we mess something up, we definitely hear about it as well too. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, and this may be kind of, can, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Can, yeah. I was going to ask you something, but go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to add, I mean, I think I'm hearing a few key words that since this is a workshop, it's really important to highlight. Um, both gentlemen have said how much work it is. And so for podcasters that just want to get high, with their homies and talk <laughs> yeah. about their cats, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you can do that podcast too. But it's a little easier to do that podcast, yeah. Well, and I, I'll be a guest for that podcast. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, but but um, you can also be the podcast that puts in those hours mm -hmm. where I think that's where, you know, you're talking about building an audience. That's where audiences go, oh, shit, these guys do their research. And I'm, a, I'm along for the ride if you get it wrong because you tried. Yeah. And so, you know, the value proposition that you're making to your audience is in the amount of work that goes into the show. So, yeah, you can be mad that you have low download numbers, but the truth is maybe your show's not very good yet. And, you know, I, I would also push back on these guys saying they were lucky. I, that sounds like bullshit to me. It sounds like you were smart. It sounds like you did the exact right thing by by having Chris and connecting with with the people you're talking yep. about. And look what happens, you know. We all know Chris Hanna's a good guy, but there's a lot of people that go, oh, I would never say hi to him in public or I would never reach out to him on Twitter. <laughs> well, get over that shit right now and yeah. reach out to these people because they want to talk to you. Yeah. These people want to talk about their music and their work and their, sure. their you know, the, the what they're passionate about. Yep. And that for an audience is so valuable when you find the gentleman, you find the podcast team that goes up and does that for you. I mean, that's how you build an audience. So hats off and kudos to these dudes for, for putting in that work and working in that way. Thanks, yeah. Ryan. I mean, that means a lot. And like, that's like the biggest philosophy that I have is like, if you have a guest that you want, always ask, always reach out, always try to find a way to communicate sure. with them, no matter who it is. Like on my other podcast, I had like the celebrity chef, Eric Repair, who was Anthony Bourdain's best friend <laughs> on my other show. And I just kept reaching out and I was like, I, I want him on the show. And so just like, you just have to, not be afraid you know you have to just re continue to communicate and whenever you have an idea for a guest always ask because you never know who's going to say yes what are they going to do say no okay they said or, no. or nothing or they say nothing and you just yeah, move on to the next one right yeah yeah, yeah. yep and that ties well, in i think with what you were saying with what what has helped the show grow with some of the great guests that we've been able to talk to 
um, you know, Greg just saying, hey, I'm just going to email this person or their manager. And, you know, John Darniel from the Mountain Goats was my yeah, was dream good. guest when we were brainstorming the show. It was a good episode, too. And, yeah. And, you know, we, we you know, he kind of reached out and we, you know, we asked and, you know, this this is a band that living in, you know, Indiana, I, I only know so many people who I can like kind of bounce ideas off of, but I know so many different, you know, either other bands, musicians, whomever who have a shared interest. And sure. I, th- I think it's just also perhaps a reflection of the loneliness and isolation of the last few months of like, you know, a, a historian I talked to said, this is like the coolest thing I've done in a few months. So right. I, I think it, it's also yeah. just because no one's done anything in a few months. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. So it's been, it's been like, uh, I, I think a reflection of just the reality of what, what people are going through yeah. um, to be able to just take, you know, 45 minutes to, to just talk about music for a while. Well, I think, I think you're right too, for sure. I think that this, this the pandemic has helped people in terms of uh, realizing projects like this because they now have the time or they have other things that are just they've been on pause. So it's like, well, I had this idea six months ago. I'm going to try it now. Right. But um, Ryan, I was going to ask you, like, because you have a background as a comedian and then yet you've obviously had the podcast Red Man Laughing for a while, which deals with some of your comedy elements. But but then you've done some very serious material as well. Thunder Bay being probably the most high profile example. Do you have trouble kind of figuring out who your audience is because some people are there for the comedy. Some are there for the, uh, you know, serious uh, social issues. Um, is, is there a lot of crossover or do you have kind of separate audiences for the different sides of what you do? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, I think when you're making something, if you spend a lot of time worrying about how this is going to land, um, I think you'll lose sight of, of, of the actual goal of making the thing. And so regardless of what kind of podcast you're doing, whether it's the investigative journalism I do or the stand-up comedy I do, um, I'm really just driven by the process. And so for me, um, process over product uh, every day, all day, when, when in, ter- in terms of the work. If okay. you're focused on uh, continuing a good, solid process, the product will come. And I can't control how people will react to to what it what gets made, um, I can do certain things to ensure that you know the voice or the the tone, the themes in the show uh, are directed at 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 those in power or those in community in the grassroots. Those yeah. are that's a different writing challenge. But um, for me, process over product really helps me just continue to focus on the work. And I started using a couple of other words really as, as really instructional words for me. And they come from the history of Canada. And I'll save you the boring history lesson, but I'll just say Canada's founded on treaties. Uh, they, sure. There was no Indian wars. There was, it's not America. It's a very different story. But the treaty language that is used in the creation of our country is the spirit and intent of the relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous people. And I took those two words and I started looking at my work. What is the spirit that I enter this work? Why do I want to do this work? What's motivating me? And then what's the intention of doing it? And that for me has really helped me point towards audiences and stay focused on, you know, the audience that may be there for a particular show, the spirit and intent in which I work really drives me towards the, the goal of making the thing in the first place. So those are kind of instructional words that, that um, have helped me stay focused in that way. Cool. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention for anyone who's tuning in here, if you are watching on zoom, you can, uh, there's an th- option to raise your hand. If you want to ask a question, you can also type a question into the Q and a thing and we will get to those as they come up. Uh, we're going to keep talking, but if someone does pop in with a question, um, you know, uh, we're still learning how to use this too. This is the second panel we've done of the weekend of, of panels. So hopefully it'll go right. Uh, we have our, our pal James behind the scenes uh, making things happen. So I'm going to keep talking to you guys, but if someone, Oh, we got a question right here. Um, so I got to figure out how to do this. Let me see how to do this here. James, help me <laughs> make it work. You're doing great, Sam. You're doing yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, what? I'm going to keep talking until James figures out how to get the, uh, the questioner in here, but um, I don't see any hand raised. So. Oh, there was a hand raised and it's disappeared now, I think. So, um, okay. If you want to raise your hand again for it, if you want to answer a question, uh, go for it. If not, we'll wait until the well, next Yeah, the, the voice of God, James. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> one, one thing I wanted to mention kind of uh, in relation to what you were just saying, Ryan, is that I, I've noticed that and this isn't because of the pandemic or anything, obviously, but 
I think that your show has, has potentially played a big role in getting a lot of, uh, not your show even, re- re- rewind, erase, repeat question. Um, I've noticed that the the people who are podcasting, the demographics have changed a lot, which is a really good thing because for a long time, we just a bunch of white dudes in their basement getting high talking about their cats. And, and for a lot of the, in a lot of cases, it's still that. I mean, there's a lot of shows where it's, you know, three white guys talking shit and that's the show and they have tons of listeners and all more power to them. But I mean, I, I've noticed in the past, maybe two years, just the, the diversity of podcasters and the diversity of subject matter. I mean, even within Winnipeg, there, there's, uh, there's more indigenous podcasters than we have before, which is awesome, especially in a city like this with, with a lot of issues that, 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 that social issues that affect that community. Right. And so what is kind of your view of, of how the podcast, um, demographics are changing because they, 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 to me they seem to be as someone who's a member of the kind of the older group of being an, a white guy talking to a lot of other white guys sometimes you know yeah i think i think what has changed is we've seen genre um and the categories that we're where we drop our podcast into really start to take a bit more prominence in the conversation around discoverability mm-hmm. and so you know how are people discovering podcasts yeah, through social media and, and people posting, you know, what they like about certain shows. But I think I think also we, we can see which genres are, are the biggest in the world, right? Um, my podcast, Thunder Bay, which I'm currently uh, in the field uh, uh, making right now, making the second season to it nice. currently. Um, but it's, it's, it's in the true crime genre. Well, there's no genre of podcast larger than true crime right now. As sure. disgusting as the genre is, <laughs> and, and all these weirdos that email me going like, there's not enough death, more death in your show, please. <laughs> um, the genre itself is unstoppable. I, was, yeah. uh, I won't name the podcast festival, but uh, Red Man Laughing was programmed um, for like an 8, 8, 8 p.m. Re- live recording. And after me was a Canadian true crime podcast. Okay. And, you know, I pull good numbers. I sell enough tickets that it's worth booking my show at a festival. Um, but the true crime podcast uh, had lineups out the door. And I think close to 200 and something people didn't get in. Wow. And so, you know, and, and all they do is read obituaries and pull the reporting from local news around the death of this person and read it live. And that's their whole podcast. And it's, it's one of the largest podcasts on the internet. Now th- that genre itself, I think um, has proven to be uh, like really, really, really um, uh, what's the word? Uh, like it, fuck. Why, why is there no <laughs> words in my mouth? It, you make money. You can make money. You can really totally. you know, monetize it. It's monetizable. Totally. Um, and so I think the move to, to focusing on specific genres, comedy podcasts, business podcasts, people go, oh, do you listen to podcasts? Yeah, I listen to this business podcast. Um, I think there's something about the genre and the categories that has really changed in podcasting, which is why we see sort of more and more specific type of genre shows doing well. Okay. That's, that's that's a good point. Yeah, it's 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 still sort of. I think I feel like podcasting was at first described as being like the Wild West, where there's no rules and there's no you know kind of no one's overseeing podcasts, and it's still like that a little bit. But it definitely seems to be moving more towards people trying to find kind of corporate ways to to make money off this, and that's obviously not going to happen for people starting out a podcast in their basement, uh, especially not right away. And I think that's again, like I said at the beginning, I think that's a lot of people's problem is they they see like uh, you know a Joe Rogan or somebody who's making millions millions of dollars talking about uh, psychedelics and fucking MMA. <laughs> and then, and then they start their own podcast talking about the same thing and they get two listeners. Right. And it's <laughs> like, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. What, what advice would any of you have for someone who is starting out and has got past that point where they've produced a show, they're happy with the content they've, they've done all the work and then they put it out to crickets. Well, um, so I, I did start a podcast from scratch out of a classroom in Columbia, Missouri in 2017 to crickets. And I thought it was just going to be like a local project like that I would do for my parents and the students that were in my classes. Yeah. And about after about 20 or so episodes of that, uh, which I use as a classroom resource, I started a few people found me and they're like, oh, I'm the publicist at so-and-so publisher. And we're going to, we're interested in having this person on your show. So right. like 
the longer you stick with it, you never know what opportunities are going to arise from doing something that uh, you don't know where it's going to go when you start it. But if you stop at episode two or three, when you only get like nine downloads, you're, you're, you're missing out on what it could become in the future. Like, cause my little classroom project that I did uh, starting back in 2017 now has like 200,000 downloads around the nice. world. And I've been, I've been invited to speak at academic conferences. Um, you know, I, I get hired by certain groups to do a little miniature podcast series. And all of that started because I was doing a project for my high school seniors yeah. in in, in an English class. Um, and so you never know where these project projects are going to take you. And so if you go in knowing that like, this is going to be a hobby and I'm just going to have some fun and I'm going to make something that I care about and I'm just going to see what happens. If you stick with it, you never know what doors are going to be open to you. If you just keep going. For sure. I don't want to interrupt this because it's a good, uh, good thought, but we have a question here uh, from Billy Bob is the name. I don't know if that's his actual name or not, but if it is, I'm sorry I made fun of it. Uh, it says, are subjects less regulated doing a podcast than if you did them through a regulated medium like radio? And I mean, I think that my answer to that is, yeah, obviously, because podcasts are, you know, there's no there's no uh, censorship. You can say what you want. We've said a bunch of things here that maybe wouldn't fly on, uh, you know, mainstream radio. And also, you're, you're not, if you're doing it yourself, you're not kind of beholden to anyone. There's, there's no boss usually in a podcast situation telling you what to cover or who to interview or, you know, even how long it has to be. You kind of, it's really open, wide open. I don't know if anyone else has anything to, to talk about on that, but comparing like, you know, a traditional radio job to, to this. I've never had a traditional radio job. I'm a high school teacher, but like, you know, we're doing a podcast where our, our show is song by song through Propagandi's discography. And that is something that you would never do on a normal radio station. It's just a completely niche thing that a few small, that a small group of select people would be super into. And that's why we get to do it. Yeah. I think our parameters or, or limitations are probably more thinking about one, our own expertise and knowledge, uh, the connections that we have with, uh, you know, reaching out to guests and then trying to predict in a way um, what the listeners might think or how they might react and not necessarily shaping it around that and avoiding certain conversations or topics, sure. but, but just really being aware um, to, to know that this, this show isn't to, you know, stir up drama. It's not to, um, you know, like pretend to be experts. It, it, it's really trying to just offer our thoughts and ideas and I, I think that is probably our own like biggest, you know, li limitation. Well, there's, and there's a lot of like uh, free speech podcast people that are like, well, we come to podcasts so we can say whatever we want. Well, yeah, you can say whatever you want and free speech all day. I'm a comic. I get it. But, you know, we've seen in the podcast space time and time again, where, where there are limits to, yeah. to free speech and there are, there are um, there 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 is still consequence for speech, and so you know, it, and we can use Rogan as an example, right? He had to issue a public apology um, because he was he was spouting some bullshit that he yeah. saw from one source on the internet. Well, that's a new responsibility he has because of his relationship with Spotify. So for it sure. depends on the kind of podcast you want to be. It depends on how you're publishing, if it's through a network or not what their standards and practices are and whether you want to be sued or not. Like, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of litigious people out there that, you know, you use their name the wrong way. You might end up with an email that you don't want to get. So just be aware that if you're a lot of, I, I've seen a lot of this where people go, well, I'm going to start a podcast and say whatever I want. Okay. Well, have fun with that. There's yeah. limits to it. Just know that there's limits. Yeah. Just so it's not this like wild west space that we're all kind of, um, imagining it to be. There's still consequence if, if, if you go off the deep end. Well, I think another consequence too is that a lot of people, you know, they, they do that kind of show where they're just, I'm going to talk shit about whatever topic and then they forget that the internet is forever and this stuff is going to live somewhere, even if they take it down. And, you know, if you're say running for office 10 years down the road, or, you know, you're going for a big job <laughs> and your name is associated with some really, you know, offensive, whether it's, whether it's racist or sexist or homophobic or, or just really shitty, uh, content right like it can come back and so people i think 
don't think about that because they think, oh, I'm making the show. My friends are going to hear it. It doesn't matter. But yeah, you have to, there's, there is a level of responsibility, even if there's no one above you telling you, you can't publish this. And this has happened in this, in the comedy space specifically, right? In, it, the yeah, era of, yeah. in the era of me too. And other things where, you know, the bros and the dudes are sitting around, you know, talking about all of their war stories. And it's like, it's disgusting, but yeah, it's on the internet and it's easy to find. So I mean, it just, you know, just be careful. Just be careful. Yeah. Just be a, be a good person. Don't be a shitty human being. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think a great example of that is there was one in Winnipeg. I'm not going to name the restaurant, but people here probably know what it is. And they uh, started a podcast out of their restaurant. And they did about two episodes there. They're like promoting the hell out of it all over their social media, that it was a thing they recorded within the restaurant. And they started talking smack about their customers, like mm. on, on the show. And it got, it wasn't a very good PR moment for them. And <laughs> I, I don't think they expected it. I think they thought, oh, they've watched, you know, some of these podcasts that are a little crass and, you know, people saying whatever they want and getting drunk while they do it. And then we can do that. We have a bar. And yeah, it <laughs> lasted like three episodes and then it all got completely removed. But I think they lost probably quite a few customers because it said some awful things, you know? So yeah, you got to watch Sam, out. Sam, can I go back to the um, yes. uh, starting from scratch thing? I just wanted to add, um, when you're starting, make a bunch of stuff and don't publish it. Mm-hmm. Like make a bunch of, of episodes of your show before you hit publish and then make them better. Yeah, I'm guilty of it. I look back on my feed and there's, I don't know how many, hundreds of episodes will, uh, uh, combined that there is, but I look back on some of the stuff that I couldn't wait to publish. And I was like, Oh, because you get that little hit, mm-hmm. that little hit of dopamine. That's yeah. like, Oh, hit publish, baby. I'm gonna watch the <laughs> downloads roll. And, <laughs> and so you hit publish too early and you know, three months later, you look back on it and you're like, God, that is a steaming pile of crap. Uh, how did I publish that? Well, just give yourself enough time to practice to make your show as good as possible. I'm going to, I'm going to be the grumpy uncle in the room, I suppose. (laughs) And just say, if your podcast isn't being downloaded, downloaded, it may be because it sucks. It may be because it's not ready to publish yet. And so I always encourage people when I do workshops and, and, and help people start tighten up that format, think deeply about that format find pieces of other podcasts inside of their formats that work and see if you could replicate them inside of your own show in, in, in your own context. Um, and just get really comfortable inside of your format. Um, because you know, that is the reason why I tune in time and time again to specific podcasts. Cause I know that they're going to do that favorite bit of mine or that, that, sure. you know, weird Canadian history trivia. And I look forward to that inside of that podcast that only comes through creating a strong format. And so I would encourage new podcasters looking to start to think deeply about the format of their show to publish a bunch of practice ones before the, it goes out into the world and just make really sure that you feel good about the show you're making. I yeah, think it's a I really would- good point. Yeah. I definitely uh, echo all of that. Like we have several episodes of our propaganda related podcast that we haven't published because like, we're like, that wasn't very good. And we just like sat on it and Mm. they'll just sit in my hard drive forever. And I go back and I look at some of my early episodes from my other podcast. And you know, that formatting thing is so essential. And I spent over a year riding my bike on bike trails, listening to really good, well-made podcasts before I ever even tried to make one. And I knew how to do it the whole time. I was like on, um, you know, on Apple podcasts, wherever listening to shows for a year and I knew what to do. And then I got this format idea in my head and I really just uh, thought about that for a long time. So what Ryan said is absolutely spot on for formatting. Yeah. So like I, I have on my feed, there's episodes of my show, like I'm 500 and something episodes in, you can go back to the first one and it's bad. Like it, it's whenever I see that someone's downloaded it, I kind of cringe like, why, why did you start with that one? Like, you know, you're never going to listen to my show again. Yeah. Like, I don't know why I even keep it there, but it's like, I guess I feel like I have to, but it's like two and a half hours of just rambling and it's, it's mm-hmm. not funny or engaging or anything. And and yeah, if I had been more aware of how to do a podcast eight years ago or whenever I started it, I probably would have done what Ryan just said and, and recorded some and just like tried to work on them before making them live. Like I, I started a second podcast that hasn't come out yet for that very reason. We recorded about four episodes of it. I don't know if it will come out. It was fun. And I have these things sitting there on a hard drive, but 
I don't know. I haven't decided yet, like whether they're good enough or whether we have to rework them or, or what. So, and I, you know, I'm experienced at this and this is something I did last year. Like, you know, it's not just new people who are coming into this cold. Like I think everyone who does podcasts kind of has this experience where you need to make sure that it's up to your own standards anyway. Yeah. I'm definitely like the newbie <laughs> in the uh, chat. So the fact that Greg had already another show, show established, I leaned on him a ton in in the creation of our format, but also just getting feedback. And I think even in the short time, like I, I feel like my confidence has grown in, in my interviews, but also in our conversations. And I, I think if we would have practiced more beforehand, I would definitely feel even better about like the, you know, our first uh, few episodes, but even in that small time, you know, I talk for a living, I talk to for a living to an audience, but it's so different. Um, you know, just looking at Greg on, on zoom and knowing people are going to be responding. It took me a while to get over that. And I feel a lot more conversational and, and natural now that we've done it a ton. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think I, um, I think I broke the uh, hand hand raising thing. But the good thing about this is if you do want to ask a question, try the Q&A thing. That seems to work. And this is also going to be uh, saved on uh, – it's streaming right now on our Facebook page for the festival. And it's going to be on there for a long time. Hopefully, we'll put it on YouTube and stuff too. So, you know, if someone sees this weeks from now or months from now, if they have questions – Maybe we could shoot them to some of you guys too and see if we can answer that way. But uh, I think it's a really interesting uh, conversation because, you know, in previous years, we've done this live and it's been a little more difficult to get this kind of uh, in-depth level of, of conversation because we've had short panels and then a lot of networking in person. And this kind of gives us an opportunity to, uh, especially with people who aren't necessarily in Winnipeg too, right? So um, yeah, it's, 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 it's very cool that you do, but all of you are doing this. I appreciate it. Um, so I, I guess you know, we have, we're wrapping up pretty soon. So if anyone has any questions, now is your chance. Uh, but well, one thing can, I wanted can to I, can, can I can I add something, Sam? Yes, you can absolutely. Oh, were you? No, sorry, you were going to no, ask no, me a question. Go, go ahead. Um, I'll think of know, a better one while you talk. Uh, well, we have just <laughs> such a good ex- we have such a good example of 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 a new podcast starting, and it's it's and it's got it's got a built in audience, propaganda fans, right? Sure. And so, look, if you're starting and you're like, I just so there's a difference between like how do I say this nicely? Not everyone should have a podcast. Okay. It's like a theater fringe festival. Anyone can submit to the fringe festival. It doesn't mean you should write a play. It doesn't like anyone can do it, but it doesn't mean you should. Um, And, and I don't, I, I encourage podcasters. So I'm not trying to discourage you, but if you want to have a voice and you want to use your voice and do this, this kind of, um, this kind of sh- uh, uh, work, <clears throat> find the hook, find the niche, um, find, find where your voice uh, is, is passionate. Because when you get to episode three and you see a dozen downloads and you've busted your ass and, and, and not slept at night to make these three episodes, you probably won't continue. Um, yeah. There's some research that suggests close to 80% of podcasts in the Apple uh, podcast uh, directory have less than three episodes. Mm. Yeah, they, for just, sure. People just burn out. They bail. So yeah. You have to be passionate. You have to want to, to, to really want to do this, but find a niche. There are knitting podcasts that yep. have been in the top 200 for the last decade. There's a niche there. They fill it. And, um, and it's about community. And so, you know, I, the first thing I would do if I was starting a new podcast is I would also start a newsletter. I would start getting people's emails so that we can have a conversation away from the podcast as well so that I can get a guest. And let's just say it's another propaganda super fan who will curate the newsletter this month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They will bring in all these rare links and weird side things from Reddit into the newsletter to supplement the podcast. And all of those little side efforts, whether it's an Instagram um, or a Twitter page, all of the little supplements to the podcast build your audience. And yes, I want to listen to the podcast because I'm a propaganda fan. But if you can give me five weird tidbits about propaganda that I may not have known about in your newsletter and then send me to the link to your latest episode, once every two weeks, yeah. you're just supplementing the work with other types of work. And I think that that is a really 
important way to grow an audience is don't just depend on your RSS feed. There sure. are other tools at your disposal. And, uh, and I encourage people to really think deeply about newsletters. Well, a good, great example of a newsletter too is Canada Lens. I mean, I know you've done work for them with, with Thunder Bay. And every time I see it in my inbox, I, I'm always annoyed because I think, oh, I just listened to the episode. But then every time I just click on it anyway, and I usually find something else, a link to an article or something about what I just heard. And like, I, you know, I usually don't sign up for newsletters, but that one is one I use literally every week. And uh, it's, it's been useful. So for sure, there's definitely, a, definitely a, a, an option for that. Uh, we have yeah, a question just- here. Don't just republish your podcast content into a newsletter because people will unsubscribe yeah. to both of your shit. For sure. Um, make them <laughs> there, different. There, there's a question here for Ryan. It's from uh, Tony, who is a local uh, podcaster. And they're on the show. Uh, they're on a couple of these panels, including the one that just happened an hour ago. And the question is, uh, Ryan, this may seem odd, but do you ever forget? Do you ever forget that you're an indigenous creator in a predominantly white space? I find I have to remind myself that I'm indigenous slash queer. Um, no, I never forget that. Um, and, and I will say, obviously, visibly, I'm not Indigenous. And so the privilege I carry uh, in that way also opens up doors. The first joke I ever told on TV um, was they only gave me this comedy special because they thought I was white. <laughs> and that's the truth. And I'll die believing that. that that's why CBC put me on TV. So that means in the space, in the podcast space in particular, I feel a specific responsibility to continue making space with my privilege. And so that's where making Indian Cowboy, Indian and Cowboy as a platform for Indigenous voices was really important to me. Um, but it's, it's, it's always front of mind in a predominantly uh, white space um, that we continue to make voices for those uh, on the margins. I, I've said this at at the biggest tables in podcasting, including the Radiotopias and others, that uh, if we don't purposely and intentionally make space for BIPOC people, for, for the queer community in podcasting, we just run the, the, the risk and danger of replicating the Hollywood system, which is old white men gatekeepers. So sure. we have to be intentional and purposeful about our moves to make space for everyone. Well, I think as as a podcaster who is one of those old white men gatekeeper, not a gatekeeper because no one listens to my show, but you know, give yourself uh, more credit, Sam. I wouldn't uh, be here if you were that's, that guy. That's fair enough. Fair enough. But but uh, you know, in terms of having guests, right? Like every every week, I do my little roundup of what the most popular downloads were. And this past week, you know, I do like sixty a picture of grid of sixteen pictures and post on social media. This week, fifteen of them were white dudes, and that is like you know, it's. The episodes that were most popular that week so I, it's not like i'm choosing to highlight these shows but you look at that and you see a bunch of white faces staring at back at you and it's white dudes and rock bands essentially and it's kind of like wow i need to be trying harder to, to to reach out to more you know diverse communities and i feel like i am but it's just in, in the subject matter i'm doing and then probably for you guys with the propaganda show too a lot of dudes in rock bands or in punk bands love propaganda right and i'm sure that a lot of the guests you who want to be on your show fit into that category and it's it's can be difficult to try and like you know you want to make it diverse you want to get voices that aren't necessarily heard but when i have 16 people messaging me asking to be on the show and 15 and a half of them you know one band has one black member and the rest is all white guys it's kind of like well this is it's tough right so it's it goes both ways in terms of i think you know those voices coming forward and then doing their own content as well as those of us who are in the the white male group kind of giving them a platform as well Absolutely. I think about it every single week and um, it's something that I care deeply about. Well, and, and it goes back to the word that we were using about the, 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 how you start out and, and to the benefit of, of, of the propaganda um, podcast is that communities there. And so we have to be in, in terms of, of these specific challenges, we have to be intentional and purposeful in doing that because it won't accidentally be that all of a sudden our guests are more representative of, of sure. our communities. It has to be intentional and purposeful. And, and we need to just build the communities we want to have our shows exist in. Right. And, um, and I will say like, at least it's the conversation now. Right. Like, yeah. and so, so let's give ourselves a little bit of credit and then get on with the work. At least it's a conversation now. We're just a few years ago. This wasn't this. We weren't talking about representation in podcasting at festivals, yeah. right? Yeah. It wasn't on the agenda. And at least it's 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 here. We're talking about it. We're mindful, and we'll get better. We'll get better. Yeah. 
Yeah, cool. Well, yeah, I think um, I, I hope, totally I hope that answered your question. Um, and uh, I think we kind of went off on a few tangents there. But <laughs> I think it covered the, the, the basis of it for sure. And, and that's something that I've, you know, I, I never had to, uh, to think about as, as a white male straight podcaster. Like, it's just, I'm just doing a show. It's not, I don't worry about my identity being portrayed in a certain way on the show because I, I have the privilege of not having to consider that. Right. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how that, um, that conversation, like you said, is, is happening now a lot more than, than it used to. And hopefully it continues, continues that way. Um, we're going to be wrapping up in a few minutes. Uh, maybe just to kind of get off all these topics here. Do you guys want to just tell me about your shows and where, he, where people can find them? Might be a good way to kind of uh, close it out here. Sure. Um, you can find Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, et cetera. Um, you can find us on in, on on social media at the handle Propaganda Pod. Uh, we're very responsive there, and we try to respond and get back to everybody. And we have 19 episodes out, and every episode is about a different propaganda song from the records. And our plan is to do every single song. So we're as many propaganda songs as there are released in the world. That's how many episodes we're going to do. So we have a distinct start and a distinct end. And we're not going to do the show when we run out of songs. So we're hoping to just do every single song and we'll see if we make it. Do you have an idea of how many songs there are at this point? Uh, we're shooting for trying to get like 100 because there's about 88 songs that are released on full length and then a variety of, you know, the seven inches and the compilations and the live tracks and stuff like that. So we're going to try and get uh, through as many as we can. And if we can get over 100, I would be absolutely thrilled. Cool. And what about you, Ryan? Where, where can people find your work? Um, Red Man Laughing is the name of my uh, podcast that I've been doing for a number of years. Um, but I'll direct you towards the Thunder Bay podcast um, that I'm, I made with Canada Land. Uh, season one uh, did very well for us. And uh, as I say, I'm currently in Thunder Bay in the field uh, making season two. And uh, you can look for a trailer. Uh, I'm not allowed to say, but very soon, cool. uh, within cool. weeks, um, you can look for the trailer. And uh, yeah, Thunder Bay podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. Well, I think I've told you this before too, but Thunder Bay is like the first season was fantastic. It was one of the best podcasts I've heard in a long time. And I'm really, I'm really happy you're doing a season two um, for people who haven't seen the show or seen, heard the show. Do you want to just give a bit of background about what Thunder Bay is all about? Thunder Bay is a city in Northern Ontario. Um, it's close to where I was born and raised in my hometown. And uh, the, the city of Thunder Bay really is the city of Canada. It's a failed uh, experiment under the guise of colonization. Um, those that uh, suffered the most at, at the colonial experiment through North America are indigenous people. And the fallout in Thunder Bay has been very specific and very, um, very public. And so we enter Thunder Bay uh, at a time in the first season of the podcast when the mayor is being investigated for extortion. Um, the police chief is being uh, investigated for obstruction of justice um, there's, there've been, uh, a, 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 an inquest into the undetermined deaths of nine indigenous youth that came to the city of Thunder Bay, um, to go to high school because they don't have high schools in their first nations communities, um, mixed with a whole bunch of other usual problems inside of cities, gangs, um, bad drugs, uh, um, human trafficking. Um, and, uh, and we, go right into the middle of it and, and package the story to investigate why colonialism fails and why Canada in large part has failed. Um, and we're back here in season two, for those that have listened to season one, we're back here looking at, at, uh, at the systems that fail and digging deep into the systems that fail. So um, yeah, to be continued, I suppose. Cool. Cool. How, how long does it take you to put together a season of that show? Just out of curiosity. Season one took me about a year and a half, the better part of a year and a half. Um, this one will be uh, much quicker. So cool. I've been working on this for the, since basically um, the start of lockdown, the start of COVID. Um, so it'll be about eight or nine months. But this time I have a team. Um, it's not just Jesse Brown and I working on it. Um, we have a team. So um, 
it's going well. Um, I came here knowing what I knew after season one, thinking I was coming into a city that has hit rock bottom. Yeah. Um, uh, the first 10 people I talked to about my hypothesis laughed in my face and said, if you think Thunder Bay hit rock bottom, you don't know Thunder Bay, which is deeply unsettling. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. watch out for season two. Yeah. Well, I was going to say that the first season, a lot of things in that first season reminded me of Winnipeg. And then now that you say that, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I oh, want to make that comparison. And I'll give I'll give people a, uh, in Thunder Bay and Olive Branch and say like you're right. Thunder Bay is not unique. Um, there are, are Thunder Bays all across Canada and the United States where um, when you when power runs amok, bad things happen. And when when our democracy, when a pillar of our democracy is our media, when when media can't get it right, when media can't get access, when media is is in bed with some of these people, you get something like the wire. It's sure. It, yeah, people yeah. say like, Oh fuck, this was like the wire. And it's like, yeah, no, um, it absolutely is. So it's, you know, for anyone looking for, for something, it's only five episodes. Um, uh, it's, it's bingeable for anyone looking to get their pants knocked off. Uh, give it a shot. Yeah, yeah it's, a good, it's a really good show. I, I think that at this point, you guys need to get him, uh, like, you guys need to work together on some kind of propaganda episode. Because I know, Ryan, you were on one of Chris Hanna's uh, podcasts on his previous show. So awesome. you, have, uh, <laughs> you guys should make that happen. Ryan, yeah. I'll email you. I actually just downloaded the entire season one of Thunder Bay while we were sitting here, too. <laughs> oh, that's cool. That's cool. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously the Winnipeg Connect with Chris and uh, some of the work that Propaganda was doing publicly through their podcast and their social media was so exciting. So when they emailed me to be on their show, I was like, as if, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, right. You know? Um, and then, you know, they came, they came to my house to record it. So I had to pull out my vinyl and I'm like, am I going to be the guy that asked them to sign my records? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fucking right. I'm going to be the guy. So yeah. like, you know, Hey guys, I got a little Sharpie here. I don't know what yeah. you think about this. Yeah. So, that's awesome. Um, if I'm ever like really broke, and this podcasting shit doesn't work out. Maybe I'll <laughs> raffle off some of the autographed vinyl on your show as like a GoFundMe collaboration. Which actually, be like a send a Ryan to Mexico because he's given up on life kind of thing. Like we kids, let's work something out, guys. It's the retirement yeah. plan. <laughs> That's right. That's I'll right. be in touch. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, just uh, just one, one more thing. We got about eight minutes left here. Um, so what advice do you have for someone starting out? Because I think that, you know, like I've said a few times now, one of the major roadblocks is just not having an audience and feeling like you're defeated and all this work you put in was for nothing. I know we've kind of gone over a few things throughout this about, you know, ways to sort of develop that. But if someone comes to you and says, I know you do a podcast, I know it's successful. What the hell do I do to make mine reach an audience? What would be the easiest answer there? Or the, the most obvious answer? There well, are right. different answers depending on if people need to make money for one. Mm -hmm. Keith, go ahead. Of sorry. course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think, Ryan, the, the words you said were spirit and intent, right? Mm. Um, so I think it's individual purpose. For me, I didn't want to make money. Um, I didn't really care if a ton of people were listening or not, or if we actually got the big name uh, guests that we had brainstormed. I just wanted to, to talk about something I really care a lot about and to learn more about it. And if people thought it was good, and if I got a little better along the way, then I would keep doing it. And that, that was like my personal goal. And that's what I kind of keep that. That's what keeps me going. Um, and what I hope to get better at. So I, I think it's individual. And for me, I mean, that's what it was. Fair enough. Ryan, go ahead. Uh, I would just say community. Like if you're starting out, take a look at the category that you're going to upload your show into find five or 10 podcasts to listen to inside of the category, look at your competition, look at your comrades, look at the people that you might be able to invite onto your show because they have podcasts in the, in, in the same category. Um, um, and, and, and vice versa, look to get onto their shows if possible. Um, community, community, community. If you're doing this alone, it's very lonely. If you're doing this alone and in, in, in a silo or in a vacuum, you will you will quit. I guarantee yep. you, you will quit. Um, so so try to find that community and try to find the, you know, <clears throat> sometimes, uh, the, and especially podcasters. I find podcasters to be really kind and gentle people. They want to help each other. This is an open source medium. 
right? This isn't a gated community. Um, and there are really good people that when you need a kick in the ass, they'll kick you in the ass. But when you need a thumbs up or a, or a kind comment about the, the hard work you're doing to try to make a difference or to try to build an audience or to, to publish your show, you'll find that in the podcast space. So get your community, identify who your, your comrades can be and roll with them. Roll, sure. roll with the community. I think, it, especially because this is the Manitoba Podcast Festival here in Winnipeg, uh, between festivals every year, we've been meeting once a month, whether it's on Zoom because of the pandemic or in person at like a Robbins Donuts or something. And we've developed, or it started off this festival two years ago with three people. And we were doing, I was doing someone else's podcast. And that's how this conversation came up between me, that host, and his producer. And we wanted to do something to build a community here. And now it's grown to the point where, you know, depending on the month, we could have anywhere from like more than a dozen people showing up. A lot of them have never met anyone before and they just want to talk about podcasting. So part of the reason that we do this festival every year, I think, is to continue building that local community. And there's a lot of shows that uh, I listen to now that I never would have thought would have been up my alley. But I've discovered through just meeting with people in person and, and talking to them about what we do. And, and, you know, we give each other business cards at the, at the stupid donut meetings. And then I go home and I have the stack of business cards. And it's like, what is this topic about? I don't even know what this is, but I'm going to look it up. And then it's like, oh, this is my new favorite show. So by the way. How dare you? Like the most Winnipeg shit in the world too is a Robin's Donuts. I, know, I don't know. If, I know. I don't know if our fans and the friends in the U.S. know what a Robin's Donuts is, but how dare you guys? I see Here, a uh, yeah. of Robin's. I'm like, these Winnipeggers are serious about Winnipeg, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, here in Buffalo, it's Paula's Donuts is our big thing. Here. <laughs> well, we're running out of Robin's Donuts. Like, they keep They're closing. Almost gone. Uh, yeah. And it's it's funny because I, I've done so many interviews at Robin's Donuts, too. It used to be my go-to uh, to interview bands and stuff. So it'd be like, oh, they, their jam space is being used or something. Let's go to Robin's Donuts. And, and there's I've been counting. There's at least three of them that I've been to that are now gone forever. And it's just like the number of Robin's I've used as, as an interview spot is dwindling. And it was great because no one was ever there, which is why it closed. But it was always this empty room. <laughs> and no one bugs you and you can sit there for an hour have a no one goes there no that's right so yeah, yeah it'll be very quiet yeah yeah but <laughs> yeah I, I guess it is very winnipeg and i'm sitting here i got a slurpee like this is the most winnipeg you can't see it because it's yeah it's the most winnipeg shit ever um and by the way these aren't sponsored ads these people aren't paying sound no 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 definitely not no, no. I, I wish they were i, I wish they were. i actually asked robin once robin's once on twitter and they're like i talked to corporate and i didn't talk to corporate but, um so then the next panel is coming up it is about um being a guest on a podcast and guesting on other people's podcasts. So what it's going to be is just a, a wide open discussion. There's no panel. It's just basically whoever wants to come on is welcome to come on and just talk about, you know, hopefully some of you guys, if you have time, we'll, we'll join in, but it's just about how to be a good guest, how to conduct an interview properly, because that's another thing people get stuck on too, is they have a guest and they're terrified, especially if it's someone that they look up to or someone whose work they admire. And then they're stuck in a room with them or across a computer screen with them and they freeze up. And, you know, maybe sometimes they ask questions they have written down on a piece of paper and it sounds very stilted and, and boring and everything they want to say to that person just gets lost in this this fear and nervousness and so the panel is about to start in about 15 minutes is going to be about that is just you know if you're invited on someone's show how do you act if you want to get a guest on your show how do you reach out to them how do you talk to them so um this is a panel obviously where we have organized people showing up to talk about a certain thing that one's gonna be more wide open i'm gonna be there uh hopefully we got a lot more people from the community coming and that's kind of what that's going to be. But uh, I just want to say thanks to all you guys for showing up. Um, in both cases, I listen to your shows regularly. Uh, they're on my like you know automatic download things on my, my, my podcast app. And uh, I'm really glad we could have all of you on here because uh, it's a fun conversation. And uh, you know it's, 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 it's nice that despite the pandemic and despite the lack of ability to do this live, we can have you in Thunder Bay and you guys in the States and, and make this happen. So thanks again for coming out. Thrill. Hey, the other the other thing. Yeah. Pe new podcasters, tell people to rate, comment, and subscribe to your That's show. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of listeners don't even know what that is. So you have to take the time. I can't believe we didn't say that. Rate, comment, and subscribe. And encourage people to do that every episode of your show to build that audience initially. I forget to do that all the time. Yeah. To do that. Right. I, I yeah. do all the time. I forget. Yeah. Anyway, I got to yeah. jump. Thanks, everyone. Right Good on, guys. Thanks guys. a lot. Okay, Thanks, cool. Dudes. Yeah. Later. So yeah, if anyone's uh, still in here, you know, this is going to go for two more minutes until it automatically shuts off or, or James somehow pulls the plug. But the next panel is going to be about uh, interviews. I don't know if you guys are able to stick around at all, but if you are, uh, you know, you're welcome to, to hang out and that'll be at 2.45.